Ladies, gents, whatever you want to call yourselves, I don't give a damn. It's championship week. It's over. You know, fantasy football season has come to an end. All the work we put in in the offseason hopefully was fruitful for you. Hopefully we led you to the promised land. If we didn't, we apologize. We tried our best, even though our takes stink. We really did try our best, believe it or not. We were not trying to give you purposefully bad takes. It just so happened that it turned out that way. Well, there was one. I mean, six months of RJing Justin Herbert into a rookie of the year. <laughs> kind of a bad take on our part, but in the end, it kind of worked out for me. So I'm all right with that. Yeah, it worked out for Noah and his uh, Chargers fandom. But man, it was a crazy, crazy week. I mean, this was, you know, I I, I want to say, like, we don't say it every year. Maybe we do. But this was truly one of the craziest championship weeks that I have ever experienced personally, just in terms of the swings and ups and downs and, like, you know, we watched football on Friday, and I had already, I tweeted out Kamara put fucking fantasy teams in the body bag, and then Sunday rolls, sun, Saturday rolls around, right? And we got uh, Tom Brady and Mike Evans bringing people back from the dead, right? And then we got Jeff Wilson, uh, and, and later on bringing people back from the dead, and then Sunday comes around, we got the second coming of David Johnson putting people over top. We got Brandon Cooks, all the all the has beens that we thought were washed came back out of the fucking woodworks to carry people to the promised land. And then we close out the night with Devontae Adams. And that would have been, that would have been a crazy week in itself, right? would have been like, wow, that was a fucking crazy week, but no, no, because what happens next? Lord Stephon and Savior. Diggs, our Lord and savior, Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen puts me in a body bags and brings, brings Noah back to the promised land. So man, it's been a, it's been a wild season. I don't know you, you had a wild trip yourself. Um, you know, shout out, congratulations to Scott. Uh, yeah, Scott, huge, huge, huge congrats. Huge congrats to you for almost winning the uh <laughs> I think it's get faded championship. Man, Friday night, Christmas, Alvin Kamara, 57 to my fucking skull. I'm like, all right, all right, Scott, thanks for the present, buddy. Then he's got some other guys going crazy. I know D Hop and Nick Chubb didn't do so well. I was down by I think 110 going into Sunday night football. I had Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, uh Devontae Adams, and Aaron Jones. I know that you guys know I hate AJ Dillon for how much he weighs. You don't know how much it pained me that I'm like, okay, if he had AJ Dillon stats, I would have won. Just kind of thrown it away. Like, congrats, Scott. Aaron Jones is like 500 or 205 pounds. He's not going to do anything. AJ Dillon's 500 pounds. He did everything. I thought I was out of it. Down by like 70 going into Monday Night Football. I wasn't watching the game. I was like watching the Grizzlies or something. And then Yannick keeps texting me. Are you watching this? Are you watching this? I kept writing back. No, no, I can't feel this pain. I flip it over when the game ends, scores the third touchdown. Man, I sent Scott one of the biggest congrats he would have ever seen in his entire life. <laughs> Ended up winning by like 10. Scott, you're a great guy. You got my payment out to me real quick, so I'm appreciative of that. But all in all, just trying to say, Scott, congratulations. Congrats, man. Played yourself. Truly. Don't ever play yourself. Don't ever play yourself. Don't ever play yourself. Don't ever play yourself. Congratulations. You played yourself. You truly deserve it. Uh, you know, one of the greatest to ever do it. You're the GOAT. <laughs> uh, you know, we know and I are just we're just on this channel speaking the gospel that you have bestowed upon us, having competed with you. So no one more deserving than an almost win uh, than you. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, shout out to Scott. Guys, if you if you have Scott, if you follow him on Twitter, if you don't, it's a fucking mistake. Number one, if you don't fix make that Twitter mistake and then follow him just to see the tweets. He made a video, a compilation of people I've never really seen. A few of them I have because they're in my league. <laughs> People I've never seen in my life telling me congratulations. One guy <laughs> called me a celebrity and he said, congratulations, Noah, you're a celebrity. You're going to win, get faded. At that moment, I'm like, all right, it's a wrap. This guy's getting people out of the fucking boondocks <laughs> to congratulate me. And it ended up working. So I think I might just play that. If I die tonight, play that at my funeral, my congratulations speech, because I was called a champion before it happened. Yeah, for sure. Make sure you guys follow Scott at BDGE Scott with two T's. I don't know if anyone Scott spells their name with one T. If they do, they're fucking psychopath. Make no, sure you report them not. to the FBI. Uh, but yeah, that's Scott. Scott, this is for you right here. It's for you. See the goat? My I like how you got, put it to the, the camera. My girlfriend got me audio. this for uh, for a stocking stuff for Christmas. So you're the goat. Scott, this is for you. Um, 
All right, but yeah, man, it was it was a it was a wild wild week. I mean, you you were on the good side of it. I was on the good side of some, bad side on other. So I I'm in this uh, dynasty league which I commissioned, and I had Alvin Kamara right, and I had like Dalvin Cook and I had Tom Brady, and I thought like after Friday I was like, oh man, I'm in like a really fucking good spot here to like take home the chance. It's a rolling pot, and I won the first year. So the first first person to win three three uh three times doesn't have to be in a row. First person to win three times gets the rolling pot. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna add the second win to my total here, and then. Mike Evans comes along and then David Johnson comes along and then Mike Gesicki comes along and then Logan Thomas garbage time comes along. And then I was going into Monday up like 40 and then Josh Allen just like put the fucking coffin to me. I lost by like one point in this league. I scored 261 points and I lost, I scored 262 and I lost to 263 and uh, you know, kudos to that guy, Nico, who, who I played in the league with him. Great, great dynasty player. Um, he built a hell of a team himself. Uh, we actually went up head to head like three times this year. Every single time it was first scoring versus like second scoring. It was crazy. And it just happened in the championship, obviously. You know what that means, w, Mike? So I, that I need a new co-host. Sounds like Nico's got you running laps. <laughs> yeah, he's got my number, <laughs> dude. Every week. Uh, he, yeah, he got my number. Beat me two to one this season. And yeah, it was so I, won, I lost that league. And then in another league, I had Stephon Diggs against Josh Allen and Cole Beasley. And I won that league by one point because Stephon Diggs just went ham, obviously. And, and you know, yards for a receiver are worth more than yards for a, a quarterback. And then in another league, I was down 40 going into Monday night with just Stephon Diggs. And I won that league by like one point. So it was just like close stuff all around. It was honestly like the back and forth, the roller coaster of like, fucking up and down throughout the weekend was just one of the craziest things and uh you know you don't win all of them but it was fucking exciting i i got my blood blood boiling for sure dude i almost passed out that third touch on my <laughs> digs i was like is v him like i'm not even gonna say the word i know last week i tried to say where that wasn't a word i'm not gonna say it i was like just staring at the ref i'm like please just put your fucking hands up put your hands up i see this and i go crazy i'm like that's that's all i needed i said scott congrats letter and it was over but I think the point of this video is we're going to look back at what we did this year. Some of our worst takes because, you know, we're not afraid to be like, hey, we're wrong. Because guess what? Football is a random game. We're kind of stupid and we're not afraid to say it because I feel like at some point, like a lot of the numbers are the same. Everybody can say it. You just want to bring like entertainment and like something that's easy to listen to. So I feel like what's easier to listen to than giving you guys bullets to shoot us with. So here are some of the guys that we've been wrong about. And speaking of Stefan Diggs, we're actually going to hit the intro first and then we'll get into him. <laughs> All right, so with Stephon Diggs, it kind of falls into the same bucket as Diggs, even DeAndre Hopkins, Brandon Cooks, and also Robbie Anderson. The narrative of receivers changing teams in the offseason, playing poorly because they're in a new offense with a new coach and a new quarterback. The issue is, and I haven't really looked into the numbers too much, a lot of the charts and shit that I see on Twitter and people do it, you see a few names on there, one of which being Kelvin Benjamin. You got to realize like Stefan Diggs and DeAndre Hopkins going to play with Josh Allen and going to play with Kyler Murray is not the same as 285 pound fresh out of Applebee's <laughs> all you can eat buffet whatever Kelvin Benjamin catching passes from a was it even Josh Allen there like a young Josh Allen who wasn't accurate who we've seen be good with like smaller receivers so I think I actually wasn't like too, too low on either one of those guys because I was kind of looking into the numbers. And I think Nick brought up in a video and kind of changed my perspective too. He's like, well, Diggs, the one year he got a lot of targets, he basically produced as much as he did the next year where he didn't get as many targets because his efficiency and volume kind of balanced out. I'm like, well, he's going to be the one there. We saw John Brown the year prior kind of show out there. So we, you can kind of figure a guy of his talent with Josh Allen progressing, he's going to do better. But I think just as a whole, we kind of have to change our outlook on things like that and take it into perspective. And I remember last year, one of the first videos we did, it was the work that you did on the red zone and the goal line touches. And you brought up a good point. It's like when you compare people to the average, it's not really a fair comparison. When you compare Aaron Jones's goal line efficiency to Alfred fucking blue, <laughs> like obviously you're going to think he's going to regress when one guy's waiting tables and the other ones in the nfl and the best offense in the league so i think you have to take everything into context when we see these charts getting thrown around like oh this guy struggled because he went this offense to this offense golden tate went to philly middle of the year and had a pretty decent season amari cooper went to the dallas cowboys and had a great season they're two pretty good receivers i think that we learned this year that a guy like deandre hopkins a guy like Diggs, a guy like 
even Robbie Anderson to a lesser extent going to play with his old college coach. They're going to have a path to touches. They're going to have a role. And I think this off season with Chris Godwin, Allen Robinson, Kenny Galladay, I think there's a few other free agents up in the air, even at the receiver position. If they land in a good spot, if any of them go to Houston, even like a Will Fuller, if he goes somewhere else, I'm not going to shy away because I know the talent's there and they're probably going to land in a spot to use them as either like a 1A or a 1B because we've seen them do it before. Yeah, I did a big fat L for the wide receivers transitioning teams. And the, the funny thing though is uh, like, th- like I said, I had digs on like three of my championship teams last night and like he got me the W. So it's like, even though I was lower on digs than I should have been, it still like worked out because it seemed like everyone else was even lower than I was. I think it's uh, because people were afraid to sell him too. Like you probably didn't want to sell him for the price people were willing to pay for him because you knew. I was never a market. seller. I was never a seller. I just wasn't sure if I was a drafter or a buyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I pivoted in season to buy him on a couple teams. Uh, one of them led me to the championships, obviously. So that was totally worth it. But yeah, I think it, it definitely, we got to pay more attention to where they land. The other problem with Diggs, though, is like I was not high on Josh Allen, which is another big fat L in my loss column for this season. Uh, like this type of improvement, frankly, is just like unprecedented. That like most guys kind of like just rubber band between uh you know their their range of completion percentages like for their career what they show early on is very indicative what they what they're going to do later later on in their career and josh allen jumping from like the 50s to like the mid to high 60s and playing like the way that he is is just is just incredible so did not really foresee that one coming and then just obviously totally underrated digs on that move but yeah like you said i mean there's a lot of elite guys coming up for free agency this year you know chris godwin wherever he goes i'm barring like even the worst teams, like if he goes to like, you know, the Jack, like Jags or like Jets, like they're going to get a top end quarterback as well. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to be a buyer on Chris Godwin, no matter where he goes. Uh, Kenny Galladay, just another great talent. Uh, unsure of where he's going. But like, if any of these guys land on like Green Bay, like you're going to be all in, right? Will Fuller, Kenny Galladay, all these guys landing on Green Bay is going to be good. Even those are Devontae Adams there. Aaron Rodgers, obviously, is someone that can produce like two top end uh, wide receiver ones. So that's somewhere you want to be. But yeah, man, I mean, elite wide receivers going to a good team with a good fit that's the key i don't know if i'm gonna be buying every single person because like obj was an elite wide receiver he was the best of the best and baker mayfield was coming off a historic rookie season where he like set set all the rookie records right so that i think that's one where like that left a really bad taste in people's mouth was like hey this is an elite guy that went somewhere and just totally fucking fizzled out whether it's because of injuries fit whatever whatever like you want to say it just like wasn't really great so i think we're going to really need to study you know what the fit is in terms of like who these players are like chris godwin kenny galladay is a jump ball specialist right if kenny galladay goes to uh like freaking drew Brees, like i'm not going to be excited because drew Brees <laughs> cannot throw the ball 10 yards downfield right yeah but Taysom hill can but yeah Taysom hill can can run at 10 yards downfield i don't think <laughs> throw it 10 yards downfield but if, but if, for example if drew Brees retires and Jameis winston <laughs> takes over as quarterback then you're all the way the fuck in because that's a great fit in terms of like what kenny galladay brings in the deep game and the fearlessness and interception throwing ability of Jameis winston of just the chucking and fucking mentality like that makes me excited if, if he lands on like the colts with another year of noodle arm rivers i'm not excited rivers had a great year but i'm not trusting him with the deep ball one bit right so it's all about fit i think it's all gonna come down to fit it's gonna come down to landing spot so we'll take you through that uh, in the off season as we see this play out to see where guys land we will absolutely kind of walk through those scenarios one by one but yeah big fat l on my forehead uh, for, for fading DeAndre Hopkins and not being in high enough on Stefan Diggs, who, you know, Nick put out a tweet this the, today saying that like Stefan Diggs shouldn't really be going anywhere uh, much later than where Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams will go next year. And I 100% agree with that because the only difference between him and Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams this season was touchdowns. He was mm-hmm. a target hog. He was a deep, he was getting it deep. He was getting it everywhere. And we know that Stefan Diggs can score touchdowns. He's one of the best contested catch specialists in the league. So he can get it done in the red zone. So I think that's a bit of a uh, bad luck. But if all those things align, he continues to retain this role. Josh Allen, even if, even if Josh Allen regresses a bit, he can absolutely line up and be that wide receiver one overall next year. 100%. Yeah. And they can't run the ball. They drafted a running back. They, they drafted one stink. year prior, and Josh Allen's good on the ground. They can't run the ball. Cole Beasley was getting a lot of targets. John Brown, when mm-hmm. he was healthy, was getting targets. Stephon Diggs is still producing. He is an elite receiver in every sense of the word. He is fringy top five dynasty for me because he's still 27. And what? You're going to get three yep. more years of absolute prime, and then he can work out of the slot if he does lose a step. So I'm all in on him. A guy that I was not all out on, but I was definitely lower than consensus. And I've learned my lesson that this word regression is just something fluttering in the air that doesn't mean anything. AJ Brown, 
I wasn't completely off on him. I think he was my dynasty wide receiver, like 12, 13 going to the season. Looking back now, that was mistaken. I said the reason why I was fading him was because I thought his touchdowns were going regress, to regress. He had like eight touchdowns and like six of them came from 40 yards out. It turns out, Mike, that when you're good at something in college and then you go to the NFL in your first year in the league with Mariota and Ryan Tannehill playing quarterback, he used to play wide receiver, and you carry that skill set over and you do it week after week, maybe it's not like a fluke. Maybe you're just really good at this stuff. So Dalvin Cook, who breaks off a lot of tackles, Maybe it's not fluky that it breaks off tackles. Maybe he's a really good running back. Maybe Mike Evans catching 12 touchdowns a year, winning deep down the field despite running a 4-5. Maybe he's just really good at like getting a release off the line and winning with leverage. Maybe Devontae Adams is really good at scoring touchdowns. Maybe we shouldn't expect guys to regress just because a single counting number is bigger than it should be. And you've got to take a little game film. you got to take a little common sense into it. If a guy's really good at something and he's shown continuously that they're going to do it and the offense is putting them in situations to continue doing it, maybe you shouldn't fade that player because I look like an idiot now because A.J. Brown is a top five dynasty receiver for me. We're heading into the offseason. I'm like, is he a wide receiver one? Yes, no, in the past, he is a wide receiver one. He is every sense of the word a wide receiver one. And I think the same could be said for DK Metcalf. We were also both a little bit uh, lower on than consensus because we didn't think he could repeat it. Same with like Terry McLaurin because the analytical profile. It's like sometimes you got to throw away your preconceived notions about things and be like, okay, this guy's really good and he's going to continue to be really good because he's really good at a really young age. Yeah, uh, 100%. I mean, it's... Man, I mean, AJ Brown, I remember when we had the first conversation, like I was kind of on your side and I was like, hey, like this, this guy is, there's no way he's going to kind of repeat this type of like yak ability, this type of touchdown, this type of per touch efficiency. But then like what kind of flipped it for me is when I started looking at like Tennessee Titans, I was like, hey, like this offense might regress TD wise, but they're also going to regress positively from like a passing game script. Like they just can't keep running it that much. Like, and you saw like this, this year, they got into some tough game scripts. And they, they had to pass it out. I mean, in the championship finals, right? Like Derek Henry only put up like 10 points because they got blown out and Ryan Tannehill had to like basically chuck it a lot, which didn't work out. But over the course of the season, uh, their pass attempts kind of went up. And, and that was kind of like the training point. I was like, okay, this guy's really good. And there's definitely going to be more opportunity. And he's going to get a full year of Ryan Tannehill. So I'm like kind of in. And that's where I got a lot of AJ Brown um, after that. But, you know, I think, you know, to, to your credit, like most of the time, like it's really hard to, maintain that type of regression but this guy's just just turns out to be a beast i mean he's a top three dynasty wide receiver if you have him great good for you if you drafted him and as a rookie you probably got him with like a late first fantastic i mean you're riding him to the promised land he is going to be fantastic he is him and dk metcalf are like the monsters of the league they are the prototype wide receiver ones they are the ones that are going to take over to become like the next andre johnson's the next like julio jones like the next like megatron type receivers i'm not gonna say they're gonna be hall of famers just all the beasts (laughs) yeah yeah. i'm not saying they're gonna be for hall of famers but they're gonna be the ones that like maintain that prototype going down going down the stretch uh so it's really exciting to see uh so i mean next up on the the list of big misses i'm gonna go out here and i don't don't know if you are gonna take this l with me but um i i'm gonna take this big fat l right here on derrick henry and the derrick henry loss is 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 an entertaining one because he's been dunking on me you know, not just this year, but also like the year before this year. Um, and the way, the reason why I missed on him the year before this year was completely different from the reason why I'm missing him this year and we're missing him this year, because one, we thought TD were going to regress. Uh, but what we didn't account for was the Titans had one of the easiest, softest schedules of all time uh, in terms of like the run schedule. So Derek Henry continued to ball, but more importantly, Derek Henry just continued to ball. Like he is an absolute beast. This guy cannot be stopped in the second half. Like I've been watching all these games and I, I'm on the like running backs matter less side, but like Derrick Henry absolutely matters. Cause you put another running back in there on that team. They are not doing what Derrick Henry is doing. He is, he is adding EPA. I'm not saying he deserves like, you know, you know, top five, like $15 million a year money. I'd still rather put that somewhere else, but Derrick Henry absolutely matters. I think the good question and the question a lot of you'd be facing coming in the off season is, Hey, do I ride him out? into the sunset or do I try and trade him still? Because I do think that Derrick Henry will command top dollar because he is coming off an absolute beast of a season as the rushing leader. Uh, He's still like third in touchdowns and the team is committed to him obviously. And the team looks good, but more importantly, like even though he's 27, I think a lot of folks will be able to talk themselves into 
the, he didn't really get much workload in this first few years, which is true, right? He didn't get that many touches sitting behind DeMarco Murray. He was splitting a backfield. So he's really only been a workhorse for like two years, uh, maybe two and a half years, right? So he, you can kind of make the argument he has a lot of tread on tires. But two, he's a, he's a fucking like Greek god. This guy's, this guy's an insane. He, he, literally, he, he literally destroyed Josh Norman. Like as, as like a, as a, he took his soul and he crushed Yeah, what him dignity like he had left was pushed He's gone. right to the ground. He absolutely He's killed him. Like that Vance yeah. McDonald on Chris Conte when we put him <laughs> yeah. in the fucking shadow realm. Yeah. That's what he did all over again. He does it basically every week. He turned Earl Smith. What was his name? <laughs> Earl Smith, right? From the, the Lions? No. I definitely got this name wrong. The, the, the safety from the Earl season. Thomas. Earl, Earl Thomas. I'm cutting that out. I'm cutting that out. For sure. <laughs> I'm going to leave it in. Uh, <laughs> Earl Smith. He, he turned Earl Thomas into his own fullback on a run to the outside. The guy's an animal. And I think piggybacking off what you're saying, right? He's 27 years old and he just came off of probably like a close to 350, 400 touch season. I don't have the numbers right in front of me. The thing is like, he gets better as the season goes on. You would think a guy of that stature of that workload and how many times they run him up the middle and how many, he doesn't really hit too hard, but he's always running between the tackles and stuff like that. You would think he would slow down. And contrary to popular belief, he just like, not contrary to popular belief because like everybody talks about December Henry, but like you would think a guy that big, that physical is going to wear down and year after year, as the year goes on, he continues to improve. And that's why I have more faith in him keeping up this type of production next year, maybe the year after than a guy like Ezekiel Elliott, because we kind of saw, you know, Ezekiel Elliott wasn't put in the best situation this year with his offensive line, but Taylor Lewan also missed basically the entire year and Derrick Henry's been great his left guard was in and out of the lineup Roger Saffold I remember he got injured a few times I just think that the fact that he's shown that he can continue to produce for like 16 straight weeks these past two seasons the fact that they're all in on Derrick Henry and this offense being as efficient as it is he's something I'm going to hold on to and Mike you were asking if I was going to take the L on him this year you must have forgotten that he already killed me. So I can't take hell <laughs> on a man that already murdered me. It's like Steve Buscemi when he like crosses off the guy on the list with his <laughs> lipstick. Like I've been crossed off that list. I am gone. Now he's coming after you, Mike. You better watch your ass. You better hop back on his train this week because it's going to be real dangerous for you. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to take the L there because I kind of shied away from talking about Derek Henry because I didn't want to get dunked on again. But now you know what it feels like. Now you know what it feels like to fade a top three running back that has done everything to prove that he's a top three running back. Yeah. So yeah, that's where I'm at with Derrick Henry. But uh, another kind of hefty running back that. Hold we- on, before we before we move on here, Thre- Derrick Henry, 344 carries so far in 15 games, uh, 1,777 yards. He's about 233 yards from 2,000, which is absolutely doable because guess who he gets on yeah, Sunday? Absolutely. Texans, Houston Texans, yeah, run funnel defense. Uh, I could totally see him stiff arming one of these defensive backs into the dirt and breaking off a couple 80 yard touchdown runs even if he doesn't he's gonna get another 20 to 30 touches so you chalk it up to like a 360 370 carries plus another 20 receptions so it's another 400 touch nearly uh 400 touch season so he didn't have much tread on his tires before but he's definitely getting there i'm not saying so high what i'm saying is if you are a top end contender a top flight contender so that means you're a top one to three team and there is a clear gap between you and the rest of the field you will have to ride this man into the sunset because you just do not want to give up that type of advantage those types of points but if you're like a middling team or you know, if you're if you're like if you just won this year, but you kind of like lucked into it a little bit and you want to like refresh and, and reload, I would explore trading down by taking a Derrick Henry and turning into like a J.K. Dobbins, uh, DeAndre Swift, uh, Antonio Gibson, like some of these young running backs who may not give you the scoring advantage yet, but they had a very promising rookie season. You can bet damn sure that they're going to produce and improve going forward. So that's the approach I would take with Derrick Henry. Ride him into the sunset if you are a champion. And if you are, congratulations. But if you aren't, uh, look to make that swap and trade down because, you know, even though even though he can produce well into his late 20s and, and maybe even early 30s, his value will absolutely crater no matter what. Uh, so if you want to get out, that's the chance to get out now uh, on someone like a Derrick Henry. Yes, yeah, yeah. like what we said with Julio Jones last year, right? The upside is him being a top five receiver. The downside was him having the year that he had. But he was like a top five receiver when he was playing. We just, the injuries caught up to him. He didn't have a full season to kind of put his skill set on display so he's definitely not somebody i'm trying to sell for anything less than like a mid first round pick i think that he again next year is gonna be like a top three top five running back even with this new crop of talent coming in so i'm on board i'm on board with you there and you know pre-draft a guy that we were all on board with nick as well 
we're like, why does anybody like this guy? It's AJ Dillon from Boston College. He can't make a man miss. He he's 250 pounds of nothing. Like you're you're big for no reason. And then we saw this Sunday night. He almost put me in a coffin. <laughs> and he basically dunked on everybody that ever said he wasn't good at football. He looked really good. I know the Tennessee Titans aren't the best run defense. They're playing in snow. One of his touchdowns, like a third and one, they ran to the outside when they were set up to run up the middle and he broke away for a touchdown, but you can't ignore the fact that he looked good out there. He caught a pass, which I didn't think he could ever do in his entire life. Prove me wrong on one play. And I just think, you know, they sunk what second, third round draft capital into him. Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams are free agents this off season. They've shown zero trust in supporting Aaron Rodgers they don't add any sort of weapon so I'm not going to be too overconfident in saying that they bring back Jones or Jamal Williams if AJ Dillon's the only guy in this offense I mean if I was the only run back in this offense I could probably be like a top 15 guy because it's so good and Aaron Rodgers who also proved me wrong this year looks absolutely amazing AJ Dillon is somebody that I am starting to gain a little bit hope for in dynasty if one of those guys doesn't come back I think if it's a two-man show he's going to eventually maybe work into the goal line packages maybe him and Aaron Jones will split that because Jones is really good on the goal line but what he showed me this past week was he's an NFL caliber running back even if it's a replacement level guy a replacement level running back on a really good offense is an RB1 just look at I was gonna say David Montgomery but that offense kind of stinks but I think the if the volume and the opportunity is there on that type of offense, he's going to be somebody I'm buying in on and prove me completely wrong because he looked a lot better than what I saw on his tape in Boston College. Yeah, he. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to take the full L on AJ Dillon, but I, like I tweeted yesterday, like I think he was very impressive. And you know, some people responded and said like, "Look, Tennessee Titans are buns," and I even said like, "Tennessee defense is buns." Like they are, they're literally like one of the worst top, like bottom three defense across the board at every single position. So. Um, it, it, you got to take it with a little bit of grain of salt, but he looked good. I mean, I think the reason why I was kind of excited was because he was breaking tackles. He was, you know, running through tackles. He was, he wasn't elusive by any means. He's a, he's a lumbering, like huge, massive guy, but he was running through tackles. Uh, he, on that touchdown run they did get, he basically fought for like the last few yards by himself extending. He was getting used in the receiving game. I wouldn't say he's uh he's great there yet. Uh, but you know, maybe he's capable but we've seen this mold play out before, right? And, and it played out in the form of Derrick Henry. Is he a Derrick Henry? Hell no. Uh, Derrick Henry was an absolute beast also in college as well. AJ Dillon was great as college too, but not, not Derrick Henry level. And it would take a Derrick Henry level type improvement for him to like get there. But like Matt LaFleur saw Derrick Henry, you know, he, he used Derrick Henry down the stretch the way he did. So maybe there's room here. And to your point, about the Packers, I mean, they might not bring Aaron Jones back. I mean, it's leaning, it's looking like it's likely they don't bring him back just because it Man, is a little I don't bit get of it. like you don't have to pay him top dollar like just give him like 10 million he'll probably be happy he looks it's just me or is he like a top five running back when you watch him play like oh yeah he's a big run and he's so good on the goal line but they, they just yeah. didn't use him there at all this he, year. he's top five but he, and he's not five um but i think the, the problem is like you know now that they have this game with aj dylan i could totally see the coaches and people like talking themselves into saying like hey we got a guy you know we don't have that much cap space let's try and spend it elsewhere so i could totally see them uh kind of you know giving aaron jones the boot which sucks because you know aaron jones is just a great fit for that offense i would have loved to see him come back and, and play with them but you know wherever he goes we'll be on the watch for that but yeah aj Dillon definitely looked a lot better and showed a lot of the traits that i personally didn't see in college you know maybe film grinders out there saw it i did not see it i did not see tackle breaking ability personally but it's good to see him kind of get that uh you know get that run in and you know contrary to popular belief like even though we don't like a player and coming in the draft, it doesn't mean we're like rooting against them to fail. You know, like I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't care about being proven wrong. Like these are, these are dudes playing for their livelihood. So if they prove me wrong and they ball out, man, I'll, I will be the first to admit it and just you know kind of chug along with them. But if AJ Dillon continues down the path, he could be a, he could be a nice value um, down the line. You know, but he will be like that first and second down grinder. I just, I just really don't see him being a three down back, but those guys still have value. And if you're on it, as long as you're on a good team, right. You don't want to be a first and second down grinder on a shitty team, because that means you're not going to be in there for the most of the time when it matters most. But if you're on a good team, like the Packers who score a lot, who have a top end offensive line, right. They have like probably the best center in the league and one of the best uh, left, left tackles in the league. And uh, David, like I always fucking slaughter. I'll yeah, save David's. you because you give me the Earl Thomas. I'll save you the Bakhtiari. <laughs> yeah, David Bakhtiari. Uh, so, you know, if those guys come back, AJ Dillon can absolutely be a fantasy asset. Mike, how about two other guys that we were completely wrong on? Two other rookies. And I feel like this is 
a mistake, not necessarily a mistake, but it was like something that I don't think is fixable based on both of our approaches in Brandon Ayuk and Chase Claypool. Like, yeah. I know you're more analytical. I'm more film-based. And I did like Brandon Ayuk a little bit. Um, I think what I could have done better with Brandon Ayuk is like, okay, he went to a Shanahan offense. He's extremely versatile. Shanahan has shown with Debo Samuel, George Kittle. He brought in Jarek McKinnon, who was a quarterback in college and catches pass out of the backfield. He wants to use versatile guys. Maybe him picking them in the first round, he's going to car- carve out a role for him. Claypool as well. Like when I watched him play, I, I was definitely a bigger fan of Ayuk's film than Claypool's because Notre Dame just like seemed to not use him as a receiver mm-hmm. um, it, or like put any of his skill set to an optimum level, I guess you could say. Like he wasn't he wasn't burning guys down the field. He's running like two yard slants. And then we see him go out in Pittsburgh and be an absolute animal. That four touchdown game was immaculate. He just went out there. He made a name for himself. And then from there on out, uh, like aside from these past few weeks, he has been a great receiver, basically a wide receiver too, week in and week out. The only thing is like, how many times are we going to see this opportunity where a guy has not so great of a profile? Uh, the draft capital is somewhat there. I know the athleticism was there for Claypool and the draft capital was there for Ayuk, but like, are you really going to bet on hitting on these one hit wonders or like these one-off guys year after year? Like, would you going back, obviously you'd probably take Brandon Ayuk over Jalen Rager, but that's hindsight is 2020, right? Jalen Rager was athletic. He had the breakout age. I know he played in the big 12 and there was that concern. But Brandon Ayuk played for Arizona State, which made Nikhil Harry look good. So I feel like looking back, it's easy to say, oh, I should have had this guy over this guy. But I think realistically, if I'm being honest, I'm probably going to make this type of mistake again. I might fade a guy like just off the top of my head. I don't know much about him, like Chris Olave. I might be higher on Seth Williams and Chris Olave. And then a year from now, I'll be looking back at me and like, oh, Chris Olave went to an offense that's going to want to use him. Seth Williams can't separate. So uh, for me personally, I'm just gonna come out and say like, I'll probably make this mistake again. I'm not gonna be afraid to make this mistake again because I'll just have a take and go with it. But uh, definitely wrong on both of those guys because they've proven to be, at least for me, top 24 dynasty receivers and their versatility has really translated to the next level. And it was something that I didn't see at a Claypool at all in college. Yeah, these are one of those mistakes. I think Claypool specifically, that's a mistake I'm just gonna eat, uh, you know, nine times out of 10. Because like, the thing is like, when you take an analytical approach to the game, like I do, you're not going to get 100% hits. Like, that's just not going to happen. You're going to miss. And that that type of profile, like a senior that, like, didn't break out to us last year, that got draft capital, but, like, you know, just basically crushed the underwear Olympics, those types of guys are guys I'm going to miss on more often than not. And I'm okay with it because most of them miss. Like, the, the, most of them are not Chase Claypools, right? Most of them are, like, Miles Boykins. Like, that. That's what that's the reality of what most of these guys turn out to be. So I'm kind of okay missing on a guy like that. And, you know, it, it's not like it really hurt, hurt me. Right. Cause you know, the analytics still came out strong this year because CD lamb, Justin Jefferson um, are both guys who analytics really, really love T Higgins was someone I really loved because of the analytics, you know, even LaVisco was someone that I liked because the analytics. So, and, and then we all, obviously we faded Henry Ruggs, right. Cause he was an analytical nightmare and that was a huge fade. Right. And Jalen Rager hasn't worked out yet. He's shown some flashes, still has a lot to go. Um, I don't think I'm going to be um, totally writing him off just yet, but definitely, you know, the right move was to take someone like Brandon Ayuk. And I think that's one area where I can probably take a little bit of a learning point away is, you know, his, if you dig into his breakout age, uh, it's a little bit later because he actually played for a Juco. So that's part of the reason why I later, later on came out, came around a bit on him. And I did rank him above of like Michael Pittman. Michael Pittman was another favorite that people loved, right? It was a super athletic, big guy, senior, didn't break up to his, to his last year. And he hasn't really worked out. So like for every Chase Claypool, there's like a couple other busts that I'm, that I'm fading because I'm fading Chase Claypool. So I'm actually totally okay with that. But for Brandon Ayuk, I think what we'll have to do is, is try and make some adjustments for like people that come out of Juco and see like what that looks like. I'm not going to like adjust them into like the stratosphere of someone like a Jalen Rager. Like if I see a Jalen Rager versus Brandon Ayuk, I'm going to make that mistake nine times out of 10 every single time. But just given where how much like other film guys that I respected did like Brandon Ayuk, uh, given how well the skill set he was fit with uh, with Kyle Shanahan in terms of his usage, I think those were some insights we take away. But like you said in the, the day, like I'm always going to be a more analytics focused driven approach, and these two guys aren't enough to actually shift that hit percentage for me to actually uh, move off of that. Yeah, and speaking of JUCO, it's like kind of a one-off topic. I was listening to a podcast. I think Mark Ingram and Cam Jordan do one, and they brought on Alvin Kamara, and I didn't really know about his story in high school or college, and this isn't like part of this video. I'm just bringing this up, but he was talking about how he was actually at Alabama, and they had so many running backs there that he wanted to transfer. Nick Saban wouldn't let him transfer. 
So he was just basically an asshole the entire time he was there. Had to go to a JUCO so he could have like that gap year or whatever. And then he went to Tennessee and didn't really produce. But that kind of changed my perspective. I'm like, this guy was recruited and was going to play running back at Alabama. Didn't want to be there. Then he went to JUCO. Like, you shouldn't just be like, oh, this guy went to JUCO. He's a bum. Like, sometimes yeah, yeah. that's just how things work out for players. I know Hakeem Butler as well kind of had that because I don't really, really remember his full backstory. But I think he had like a tough upbringing. He had to go to JUCO before he went to college. So uh, not that you have to like look super in depth into these things, as you said, like you can't just over adjust because a guy went to JUCO. But sometimes there's good explanations for the route that these guys take. And if you go from a JUCO to producing at Arizona State to being a first round pick, maybe that does say something about your talent. So uh, that's definitely someone that we missed on. Another guy that we missed on, I brought up in the intro, and I'm kind of happy I missed on him because I hedged my bets. It's Justin Herbert, man. This kid, God. he's an animal. I mean, he kind of slowed down once uh, Austin Eckler came back. And I think also like defenses start to kind of understand him. Like the Bills defenses look better that he kind of got shut down by them. The Patriots defense, 45 nothing. Like that was a tough look. But Throughout the entire season, he just proved me wrong. And I actually went back and read my write-up on Justin Herbert because I kind of figured the Chargers were going to take him. So I took over that part of the write-up in the Big Dogs draft guide. And I'm like, yeah, this kid fucking stinks. Like, I don't want him at all. All he does is throw check downs, and that's what I think he's going to do. But I did say, like, I think he landed in objectively the best situation of all the first-round quarterbacks because he does have Austin Eckler, Hunter Henry, Keenan Allen in the short part of the game. And if that's what he's going to lean on, it's going to work out well. Turns out that's what ended up happening for him. I know Eckler missed some time, but... I mean, even the deep ball, like his only real deep threats are Jalen Guyton, Tyron Johnson, and Mike Williams when he's not getting RKO'd out of nowhere. So I think if they add somebody in the draft this year, he's going to be immaculate. And I'm not so sure what I can do to adjust my thoughts on a quarterback like Justin Herbert. Like we all thought he was going to come out as a junior. He didn't. He goes back as a senior. He doesn't really take a huge step up. Like you would think, okay, this guy's older and he didn't really improve. Why would I be in on him? I don't know. I feel like quarterbacks, everybody says it's, it's hard to evaluate the position. I'm not sure what I'm going to do in the future to adjust for this. And I feel like this quarterback class is like such a good quarterback class that you can't be too low on anybody. Like nobody's low on Trevor Lawrence. I guess Justin Fields, people are a little bit lower on, but he's probably going to show out in the college football playoff, which is going to readjust everything. Uh, Mac Jones and Zach Wilson, like they're looking great. Trey Lance didn't really play this year, but I feel like everybody's going to be high in quarterbacks this year where like a Justin Herbert situation won't really play itself out. But in the future, if it does, I don't know. I think this is like a clay pool. We kind of just got to eat it because there's no rational way to justify why you were wrong on a guy like Herbert. Yeah. I mean, uh, my lesson learned here was I, I just like way too overweighted his senior year when he had already shown enough in his, like in his younger seasons, like in his, in his uh, sophomore, in his sophomore year, like Justin Herbert had already shown out. I mean, last year there was talk about him being the top pick overall, right. Over, over a um Kyler Kyle Murray. Murray. So, and then so of, like yeah, yeah, I think I just like way, way, way too over indexed on like one bad year and didn't really understand that like, you know, what I learned later is that his his coaches were were awful. Uh so his they coaches are, so. at Oregon were awful. Like the talent he played with was awful. I went back and looked at his wide receivers, like all bums, like none of them are really gonna Who do was anything. Was that guy Mitchell? Uh something Mitchell he played with. I remember reading something his comp was Odell. I'm like, what the, who's, right yeah, yeah, it was, uh, Dylan Mitchell. what was his name? Something Mitchell. Yeah. He, um, I almost called him Donovan Mitchell. I'm not going to mess up on another name this episode. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he, he was, oh, fuck. What was he? Was it Jawan? That was like his junior year, right? Mitchell. Yeah. Mitchell Dylan Mitchell. Junior. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I totally, totally like wrote off his, his junior year and his like prior seasons where he was like really good and really efficient. Like in his sophomore year, he was incredibly efficient and looked like all the part of a franchise quarterback and then also i didn't pay enough i just didn't pay enough attention to draft capital man he only went one pick after tua so like realistically speaking in super flex drafts he really shouldn't fall that far behind tua as well uh from that perspective so you know draft capital does a lot of the talking for me uh, going forward in quarterbacks because it's just too hard to evaluate i suck at evaluating it i recognize that um so i'm gonna do that let that do the talking and just really dig in more to like the situation in college to try and like identify why someone didn't do as well as they did but also not penalize someone for staying an extra year and not doing as well as I would have hoped they, they did. Right. So there's lots of reasons that someone stays and, you know, Justin Herbert, maybe he wanted to finish college. Maybe he wanted to play uh, is, is not as bad of a, is not as much of a death sentence uh, to quarterbacks as it is to like wide receivers in terms of like staying for a senior year and not declaring early. So I just, I just think I need to recalibrate how I think about those various factors. And, and then also I underplayed his athleticism, man. I mean, 
the underwear Olympics, people often overrate them, which is why I tend to underrate them. But, you know, when he came to quarterbacks, like he went out and showed out like a really, really good performance, which kind of provided some insight into what he could do for you on the ground as an athletic running quarterback and a mobile quarterback. So, but having said all that, even having said all that, it would have been really hard to kind of peg Justin Herbert for the year that he had, like literally one of the greatest rookie quarterback seasons of all time right and, and whenever you're talking about all time stats those are hard to see and hard to come by so technically anyone that had joe burrow as the 101 missed on justin herbert because justin herbert came out and balled out and like left everyone in the dust not just Tua, but also joe burrow so you know i'm, I'm happy because i'm sitting on a bunch of justin herbert rookie cards which are gonna you know probably go up a lot in value once he gets announced as rookie of the year uh, but I'm unhappy because I did not get enough of him in Dynasty, and he is now basically unattainable in Superflex leagues. Um, so, yeah, unless you want to pay an arm and a leg, uh, you'd have to pay, like, you know, Lamar Jackson Plus. You'd probably have to pay, like, a Kyler Murray or something of that sort to kind of land a Justin Herbert, which means that, to me, he's basically untouchable. But, yeah, one of the greatest misses of all time by myself. Um, Do you think this and, is going to change your outlook for this upcoming draft? I know running back isn't too deep, but it's extremely top heavy with the top three of ET and Najee Harris and Javante Williams. We all know wide receivers deep and you brought up that, you know, Justin Herbert was going routinely 110, 111, 112. Yeah. If, if, if there's a first round run wide, or wide receiver quarterback this year, even if it's like Kyle Trask, if he goes, whatever pick the 49ers are, are you going to let him fall out of the first round? Because realistically in the 49ers, he has a good shot to eventually start his rookie year. And if a quarterback wins a job, even if it's like Dwayne Haskins, you can flip it for a first as a rookie. Uh, even if Kyle Trask doesn't really do too well, like week one, week two, after he gets that job, you can flip him. So uh, are you going to let a guy like Trask, because I feel like he's the lowest of like the elite tier of quarterbacks. Would you let him fall out of the first round if he lands in a spot like Washington or San Francisco, where they will realistically start him at some point this year? Are you going to take a wide receiver ahead of them? Or are you just going to be like, no, we saw Herbert gain so much value that I'm not going to miss on that opportunity again. No, it, it depends on like where they're getting drafted. Like I, even, even though I didn't like Herbert, I never let him fall past the 110 in any draft I was in just because he had the top six pick draft capital. So like, it really depends on where Kyle Trask goes. I don't see Kyle Trask going top 10. He'll be like, he might go in like the range of like a Jordan love and the best case scenario. So like once you get out of the top 10, the hit rate like falls dramatically for those quarterbacks. So I'm, I'm fine with letting him go. But like if, if a quarterback goes in the top 10, they have to go in the first round of your rookie drafts. I don't care who they are. If you don't like them, you have to take them because they're going to get a starting job. And the second they start, they're worth the first round pick. So like your, your downside is your downside is very minimalized. So like with Justin Herbert, even though I didn't like him, like in drafts right where I had the 110 pick, I still took him. But I think I need to adjust that up even more. You know, like mm-hmm. I had I had two uh going at like the 1.04. So it didn't make sense to have Justin Herbert at the 1.10. What would have made sense is to have Justin Herbert in the top five, top six picks as well. So I think that's the adjustment I'll make for someone that gets that high of a draft capital, even though I, even if I don't like them particularly, but I'm not going to adjust like the Jordan Love tier of quarterbacks in the first round. I'm still going to take a shot on top end wide receivers there uh, over a quarterback. But yeah, it just, it really depends on where they go, I think. Yeah, because I know you like Tua a lot more than Herbert. And ranking them back-to-back 104, 105, that's not you saying, I think Herbert is going to challenge Tua. It's like the value of the quarterback position is so high that if a guy has a realistic shot to win out the starting job, you have to take him that high to return a lot more value than you're going to get out of like maybe reaching for a Jerry Judy or even like a C.D. Lamb. You can get C.D. Lamb plus a whole bunch of shit for Herbert right now. So I think a lesson to be learned as well, like it's a hypothetical, but say Justin Fields goes to the Jets and Zach Wilson goes to Carolina, right? If he goes to Carolina with those weapons, you might not think he's on the same level, or we'll say Mac Jones, because I feel like Zach Wilson's close to um, Justin Fields. If he goes to Carolina, I feel like you have to have them close, even if you think the talent is heavily in Justin Fields' favor, just because, you know, he's got all those weapons. He's got Christian McCaffrey and all the guys on the outside and a good offensive mind running the team that, you know, the chances of him returning value, even with like a Rondell Moore, I would I would bet on a guy like Mac Jones returning a lot more value than a rookie receiver and being able to flip it for a Rondell Moore plus once the season gets started. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, this is going to be a crazy class of quarterbacks. People are already talking about it being the greatest quarterback class of all time. I don't know about that because there was a class with Dan Marino and, and, you know, three other Hall of Famers. Uh, was it two or three? Three other Hall of Famers. They had Dan Marino. They had, uh, uh, what's his name? Jim Kelly, right? And then it had, uh, who went first overall in this? Oh, yeah, John Elway. He's like three bottom five. I have no clue. Yeah, first ballot Hall of Famers. That, that's probably still the best quarterback class of all time. But this one is going to be interesting because people are talking about 
five to six quarterbacks in the first round of the NFL draft. So it's like 2017, right? With like Baker, Sam Darnold, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So very, very similar to that. And if if like guys like Zach Wilson and Mac Jones start flirting with like the top 10 to 15 picks, you're going to have to pay attention to them and you're not going to have to be able to let them out of the first round. What I will say is this. Konami coder quarterbacks are ones I'm going to value higher. So like a Trey Lance, I'm going to rank him ahead of a Mac Jones. Uh, Zach Wilson, not not a full Konami, but still like offers a little bit more on the running side. I'm gonna I'm gonna rank them a little bit ahead of like the more traditional pocket passing quarterbacks because like if you don't have Konami quarterback, you are at a significant disadvantage in today's NFL just given how many of them there are. Um, yeah, so even that, that's the one like thing. improvised too because Herbert's not really running a lot, but he's scrambling yeah. and making plays out of the pocket. So I think athleticism is a huge factor in today's NFL. Just like Russell Wilson too, he's obviously a great quarterback, but a lot of his points come off of him just improvising and throwing it deeper, taking shots, and the defense falls apart. So I think you're completely right. Like those top four guys, the uh, Trevor Lawrence, Fields, Mac, uh, Zach Wilson, and Trey Lance, they can all run a little bit, and I think that's going to help them a whole lot at the next level. Whereas Mac Jones and Kyle Trask are a little bit more. It, like be a little less mobile than those other guys yeah 100 percent. so but yeah i mean the rule still applies like we even said it when we hated justin herbert we're like dude we cannot you cannot take him outside the first round because he has too much draft capital so you know lesson learned there never gonna fade herbert the god ever again i don't know if we'll ever see this type of ascension again but you know make sure you let draft capital do the speaking for you on quarterbacks because do not pretend to be like you're a quarterback whisperer you are not one I am definitely not one. I know that for damn sure. Uh, so I'm going to let draft capital do a lot of the talking for me on that front. Yeah. And I think that's all I have personally, like Aaron Rodgers. I think like everybody was kind of wrong on Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Gardner Minshew, I had like an irrational love for him. I Somebody DM me a tweet that I had. I said, if he doesn't finish top 15, I'm getting a mullet. He ended up like quarterback 14 on a per game basis. So I saved myself from looking like a fucking piece of shit. So I, I, I consider that a win on a per, per game basis. Zach Moss, we weren't high on him. I think the point to take away is if you're like fat and slow and you're on an offense, I can't <laughs> run the ball. Just don't draft him. Uh, just going down the list of so Clyde over to Lair. Like people think it was a flop and it was because a lot of other rookie running backs look better than him. The guy was on pace for 1,350 yards from scrimmage. Only 21 running backs have done this since 2000. So basically you get one running back a year to hit that mark only james robinson has done it through week 16 to this point so for as much as of a disappointment as he is he's still in the chiefs offense he's still young he still has the ability to catch passes i'm not going to take an l on that yet and i think it provides a pretty good buy low opportunity on him i know people are like oh damian williams is going to come back and be good damian williams was also like kind of a workhorse on the chiefs offense it doesn't take too much for a workhorse in the chiefs offense to look good so i'm going to buy in on ceh if anybody is selling him as well and then obviously like you know, Jalen Rager. Well, we don't. He, he looked Jaylen good. See, so CH, CH looked good. I don't. I don't think it's a. It's a bust. Um, and he got hurt obviously in the last. And then Le'Veon Bell came in as well. We didn't see that coming. Uh, but he's looked good. I mean, he's elusive. He's breaking tackles. He's not getting the work in the receiving game that everyone thought. What I will say though is, your boy held strong at JT one hundred and one throughout the entire year. The entire he's year. Every bit the one hundred and one. Entire year. So I think the lesson there is when you have two guys who both have draft capital, who both landed in, you know, objectively pretty good spots. Um, don't let that sway it too much. But then again, like, you know, CH could have easily popped off as well. And we'd all be laughing. So I just think like, you know, when you have guys in that tier, in the same tier, this is why I do tiers, right? It's like when guys are close, you got to have tears and do the judgment. I know everyone's out there taking Jonathan Taylor victory laps these days, but I don't think you should give up a CH either. Uh, I'm a buyer in the off season. You know, if, if people bought on Dave Montgomery, you should absolutely be buying on CEH because I think, you know, his trajectory can be much better than what we saw with David Montgomery coming into the second year. So I think that's a, that's a great one. And yeah, Jalen Rager, I, I'm like, I'm not buying anymore, but I'm also not like panic selling either because I kind of want to see what happens there. Um, and then the last one, you know, we were high on Jalen Hurts. So I'm going to take the, we're going to take a small W in this, in this long list of L's that we've shown you um, in, in Jalen Hurts and what he's been able to do and showing that Konami code and showing that upside as a dynasty quarterback. So if you guys are still waiting on Carson Wentz to get his job back, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd punch that ticket in because I don't think it's happening. It does, despite what Doug Peterson, the idiot, you know, wants to say, this is Jalen Hurts. Uh, his team he's going to develop he's not a great passer yet we saw that going up against dallas this past week but you know stay patient with him you know if you're if you're in a super flex league i have jalen hurts a couple of super flex leagues and i cannot tell you how happy i am because some of my quarterbacks are are flopping so he's gonna really step into that role for me next year and if you're trying to acquire him 
Um, I think you can still acquire him for a reasonable price, especially after that down game with Dallas. People are going to, you know, jump to the, hey, he can't throw, he can't pass, he's not going to last. What they don't know is like you're basing that off of history, and history is changing in terms of how the Guess NFL. Who else is isn't great at throwing and is almost an MVP candidate? Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray has yeah. not been accurate this year, and people yeah. are touting him as an MVP, or at least did so for the first like 12 weeks of the season. So obviously, he's not that caliber of thrower. Um, and just touching on like us, I kind of took an L on him, but I think everybody kind of did, right? Because they did sign Carson Wentz to a long-term yeah. deal. Same thing with Aaron Rodgers too. Like you kind of had to fade Jordan Love and Jalen Hurts for these guys you could see producing in the near term because I don't think anybody saw this type of fall off for Carson Wentz. But nope. if you were one of the lucky ones and you really believed in Jalen Hurts and you thought Carson Wentz was a ginger fuck who had no confidence and you grabbed him the second round, you're laughing all the way to the bank because he's basically a top 12 dynasty quarterback right now, despite the struggles he showed against a mediocre Dallas Cowboys defense. So uh, big up to you on that one, Mike. You definitely had a lot more faith in Jalen Hurts than I did. Not to say I was like extremely low on him, but you held true and you have him in more spots than I do because I have absolutely zero Jalen Hurts because I had like first round picks and fourth round picks, nothing in the second. Yeah, so look, that's all we got for you guys. You know, I'm sure we took many other L's throughout, but I think we want to talk about these because there were a lot of lessons learned here that we can kind of apply going forward. And, you know, fear not, we will take many more L's in the off season into the next year, the year after that. If there's one thing you can count on is you can count on bunk beds, the bunk bed bros to take losses because that's- Can't spell bunk bed without an L. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to get- those losses but you can always count on us to come back and reflect on them and hopefully learn some lessons improve and as long as we win more than we lose that's the name of the game so that's all we got hopefully it was helpful uh you know stick with us man stick with us in the dynasty offseason because this is when the real season begins this is when Noah and i are going to start doing the research he's going to grind the film i'm going to grind the numbers and then I'm going to try and grind the film and he's going to grind the numbers and we're going to sync up and try and provide you guys the takes heading into the off season that will help you set you up to be in a position to win next year. And that that's the key. And there is no off season. People are going to be taking time off. We will be grinding. And that is the difference between building a dynasty and losing like a sack of potatoes to people that take the breaks and go on vacation. Cause there's no vacations, no breaks, no off season for us. We'll be here all week long all off season long if you want to see specific types of content make sure you drop it in the comments we try and read all the comments and we'll try and like you know i think we'll do some like tutorials on analytics maybe you know no we'll do a couple film breakdown sessions with you guys and we'll kind of like yes, go through what we look that, for. that's for my uh, only fans that's the only yeah one <laughs> yeah exactly it's only fans make sure you subscribe to that uh fb god on OnlyFans. I don't know if that's a real account. If it is, <laughs> you know, somebody's going to make that me. shit, like try to sell me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but that's all we got for you. If you liked, make sure you hit the thumbs up. Make sure you smash the subscribe subscribe button. Follow us throughout the off season. There's going to be a lot of stuff coming your way. Uh, that's all we got, man. That's all we got.